Well, when I uh, talked before about reading the tea leaves, uh, I was anticipating our next speaker, uh, David Wertheim, co-founder of Tea Leaf Nation, uh, who's one of the world's leading analysts of the media, media scene in China. And David will be talking to us about can China remake the internet in its image. David. Well, I'll just do the, the super fast version. Can China make the internet in its own image? Maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's great to be here. Um, a, a quick uh, self-intro. So as Professor Gold said, uh, I um, uh, founded a media analysis site called Tea Leaf Nation, which focused on uh, aggregating and translating uh, uh, Chinese social media for a Western audience. Um, uh, I did so after having been a Peace Corps volunteer in China. Um, I taught English to uh, students at a normal university, a teacher's college, in a small town in China's southwest called Fuling. Um, and then I spent a few years as a, as a lawyer um, in New York and Hong Kong, and then I started this outfit. Uh, we were acquired in September 2013 by Foreign Policy Magazine based in Washington, D.C. Um, and so that's where I apply my trade now. Um, and give me one second here. I thought I'd give you a very brief overview of the, let's see if this works, great, of the Chinese internet. Um, so first let me quickly introduce the two major platforms. You've probably heard folks talking about these over the last day and a half. Um, first, we have the predominant uh, internet platform in China uh, called WeChat. WeChat is mobile only, uh, and it is a way for friends to communicate with one another, basically in private conversations. There are also ways to follow um, individuals uh, or other media accounts that publish to the world once a day, um, but mostly it's for private conversations among friends. Uh, it's a platform for communication and commerce, so you can book a doctor's appointment, you can hail a cab, you can make a payment to somebody using WeChat. It's quite versatile, uh, quite impressive. Um, it has 762 million monthly active users. That's not a typographical error. I double-checked it. Um, it was released in January 2011, and as you can guess from the numbers, it's the predominant social media platform in China right now. Also, the other um, maybe not 500 pound, but 400 pound gorilla uh, in Chinese social media is Weibo. And Weibo is uh, somewhat like Twitter. How many of you use Twitter, by the way? Raise your hand if you're a Twitter user. Okay. So, you know, Twitter is a way to communicate in short bursts. And everything you say on Twitter is potentially viewable by anybody else. Even if you've only got like eight Twitter followers, let's say uh, a famous person manages to see your tweet, and that famous person retweets your tweet. Now, suddenly, that famous person's million followers can see what you wrote. So that's just like a pro tip. Anything you write on Twitter uh, is public. Same thing with Weibo. It's a one-to-many platform. It's a way for people to communicate potentially with a massive audience. Um, and it sees itself, uh, and this is according to uh, Weibo's own language, corporate language, a platform for self-expression and per, uh, social interaction. It's got 261 million monthly active users, not too shabby. It was released in August 2009. Um, and for a few years, it was really the predominant social media platform in China. Um, but over time, it has been uh, replaced by WeChat. And what that effectively means is that uh, a platform, both of these are privately owned, by the way, um, but they're, of course, subject to Chinese government diktat. What it essentially means is that a lot of conversations have sort of migrated from Weibo to WeChat, and that means that conversations have gotten less public and more private over the last few years, which is not a trend that you might necessarily expect as Chinese social media expands, but that's what we've seen. Um, you might notice that I don't have up here platforms like Facebook or Twitter. That's because those platforms are blocked in China. Um, you may hear uh, this term, the great firewall of censorship. That's just slang for the series of uh, mostly unacknowledged hacks 
that the Chinese government has implemented over time, which effectively mean that when you try to visit Facebook or Twitter from the mainland, you'll get a 404 message and you'll think, is something wrong with my computer? No, the Great Firewall is at work. Um, some folks in China, uh, probably a few million max, use what are called VPNs, which are virtual private networks. That allows them to jump over the firewall and view these forbidden platforms, not just Facebook and Twitter, but blocked websites like the New York Times. Um, again, most people don't go to that trouble. Um, and there's another aspect to Chinese social media worth noting, and that's censorship within this uh, Chinese native social media sphere. Um, so uh, I'm going to get back to this, but posts which are um, not in keeping with government orthodoxy risk being censored, deleted by government minders, or by folks who work at these private companies but are effectively trying to get out in front of government complaints by doing the censorship themselves. More on that later. So I wanted to, you know, yesterday, uh, Professor Wasserstrom was sort of mentioning wacky hair in China. So I thought I'd kind of loop that into my presentation. And I want to explain the significance. So you've got some folks in the back row who are sort of, uh, um, you know, typical Chinese young urbanites and they're taking this picture with folks in the front row who are sort of the equivalent of um, Chinese young goths. Uh, and it's, they're called shamata, which, so that's what those characters say. And it, it's supposed to, it, it's this sort of um, silly term that they've appropriated for themselves and it means like smart, shamata. Uh, and what's interesting about this group, the, 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 their ranks are the number of their of these folks are, is unclear. Um, but this is a community of broadly speaking, young, disaffected, urban migrants, often folks from less educated backgrounds who are in China's sort of medium and smaller cities, what people call second or third or fourth tier cities. Uh, and what's interesting about this group is that um, we actually discovered, uh, or we were among uh, those who discovered their existence because of the burgeoning of online platforms that connect these young shamata together. Um, so they go into chat rooms and they you know, have talks um, among themselves about like who's got the coolest hair. Uh, and what's interesting is that, you know, as, as Jeff said yesterday, folks, for example, in this uh, shamata group might be conforming to their own group norms, um, but those group norms are different from the mainstream. And this group uh, did not exist as sort of a self-conscious and unified group until the advent of the internet. In other words, this is a nationwide um, minority community of interest, one that was knit together across space, across provinces and cities because of the power of the internet. Now these folks, of course, do not um, threaten communist party rule. There's nothing political about what they do. But this shows the web's ability to knit together diffuse minorities. Um, so let me just back up a little bit and talk about the, broadly the significance of the Chinese internet. There's a few things um, that compelled me to uh, leave my corporate law job and to start a platform that focuses on Chinese social media, which is not the most uh, ordinary career shift out there. Um, there's a few reasons that the Chinese social web is significant. So one is that, um, at the, especially in its heyday, which was 2010, 2011, 2012, it was the closest thing that um, China has ever seen to a platform for free speech and free debate on the issues of the day. That's a, a relative matter, historically speaking. Um, it's the freest that China's seen. Um, that's declined somewhat, and I'll get back to it, um, but it still continues to be the place where you go to sort of take the temperature of uh, the, the vox populi, I think I'm mixing metaphors, in China. Um, that's one thing, that's one reason it's important. And the other, as I just alluded to, it's a window into China. Um, it's a way to, to, to understand what, you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands um, of Chinese folks are thinking at any given time. And that's really very difficult to do using any other method. And so it's a fascinating window from the outside. Um, it's also a community. 
uh, you know, or a, at least an agglomeration of different communities of interest. And um, it sort of has developed its own slang, its own values uh, that I think makes it an independent social force, one where uh, conversations can crop up about issues um, that may be politically sensitive, and this can in some cases cause the Chinese government to rethink policies. In other words, uh, it is a silent battleground. Uh, that's language uh, that actually Chinese officials have used to refer to the internet, and it's because of its independent power uh, as a social force. Now, yesterday, uh, Professor Shi talked about you know this strict Leninist chain of command within the ruling Communist Party. Um, the party has attempted, with mixed success, to sort of graft that chain of command onto an unruly web. Uh, it has not succeeded fully, neither has it failed fully. Uh, you know, President Bill Clinton once said that China trying to control the internet was like trying to nail jello to a wall. And I think that was perhaps, looking back with the benefit of hindsight, too optimistic. The Chinese government has been somewhat successful, actually, in doing this. So th the gentleman pictured here is Xu Lin. He is the recent, he's, was recently promoted to the head of the State Internet Information Office. Basically, the internet czar of China. This is a newly created post that was previously uh, inhabited by Liu Wei. And uh, Liu Wei, who again only recently stepped down, said that he envisioned an internet where, quote, differences are shelved. I think that's significant. Uh, obviously, the Chinese government sees the internet as an engine of commerce and innovation. Uh, a potentially uh, very powerful engine of wealth creation. But it's also one, I think, where from the, ch the government's perspective, it would be great if nobody really said anything that was terribly uh, political or got people too excited. Now, I alluded to a kind of inflection point in terms of the freedom of speech on the Chinese internet. It was true that for a few years, and, and uh, after I had started Tea Leaf Nation, it was true for a couple years, that the degree of candor on the Chinese internet, even about issues that were sensitive, even when it came to criticizing government, particularly local government, was very high. People were saying things that, as a Peace Corps volunteer in China, I never would have heard anyone say out loud or to my face or really to anyone else, unless they were maybe sure that it was a really private conversation or you had really gotten to know someone well. But now we were seeing People saying things, um, you know, saying this government official has to step down, this policy has to change, the whole government's rotten, the kind of stuff, you know, we see on the internet here in the U.S., which is unregulated. But people were saying this in very public forums, um, and that was very surprising. Now, the internet had this sort of inconvenient, uh, it was an inconvenience for the Communist Party in a number of ways, which I'll get to. And so what happened in 2013 was the beginning of a crackdown on the Chinese internet. Uh, and much of that involved uh, taking so-called big Vs. These are online opinion makers. Uh, and the V is for verified. So they were famous or important enough that their identity had to be verified online. Um, so you didn't have these parody or fake accounts. These big Vs were brought in for questioning. Some of them were arrested for various charges. and. The Chinese government basically used its monopoly on force and violence and brought that to bear on the online world. Um, and the crackdown has kind of had the intended effect. So you're much less likely to see these suddenly burgeoning national conversations about political or sensitive issues that are driven by these big opinion makers. Sometimes people still talk about this sensitive stuff, but it's more likely to be cat videos and celebrity pics and food pics, which is all fine, um, but something is missing, particularly from Weibo. So some of these, which is the public platform, some of these more sensitive conversations have migrated onto WeChat where they're, they're, they're more private and they're harder for, uh, they're less likely to lead to a national conversation. And as this has happened, China has also articulated a vision of what it calls internet sovereignty. 
which is basically saying, you know, we're going to regulate the internet within our borders. We're going to control what information gets in and sort of as a side effect, what information gets out. And that uh, effectively the government has made the argument that you can, just as you have national territorial borders, you can have national borders in cyberspace to map that sort of like Westphalian idea of a nation state into the online world, which is a new thing. Uh, obviously, this model is attractive to you know, other authoritarian regimes. Um, and you know, because of the connected nature of the World Wide Web, it ends up compromising US businesses, for example. So Facebook would love to expand into China and has been trying, I think, to make that case, um, but has been unable to. Uh, now, it's unclear whether the Chinese government has actually put this genie in the bottle. I mean, I'll get back to that in a little bit, but I, I think the Chinese government realizes that what it has done mostly involves bringing the threat of force to bear on particular individuals who were particularly influential, particularly loud, particularly heterodox in Chinese cyberspace. And by punishing these people, everyone else kind of quiets down a little bit and dials back what they were going to say because they've seen what happens uh, to people who are able to make too much noise online. Um, but you know, these people are still there. Their complaints are still there. Uh, and even if particular posts they've written have been censored uh, by the government, by private companies, or never saw the light of day because of self-censorship, even if accounts have been shut down, these people are still there. And their complaints and their thoughts are still there. And so in other words, this project of a controlled web where differences are shelved is going to require ongoing work, uh, constant work by the Chinese government um, in order to sort of manage public opinion and also to fill the void that results with its own uh, propaganda and its own viewpoints. OK, let me just, a little bit of this is review already, but let me very quickly give you a sense of what about the web scares the party. So one, uh, news and information can leak before it is vetted, then spread wildly. So uh, a classic example was a horrific train crash uh, in the city of Wenzhou in 2011, I think it was. Uh, the government tried to censor images of uh, trains that had been derailed, you know, uh, dead bodies, because of corruption at the state rail ministry that had allegedly, and in some cases definitely, led to these deaths. Um, but folks just took out their smartphones, took pictures, leaked this news online, and then it spread wildly. That scares the party uh, because it can't control what the public is seeing. Online anti-government anger, particularly when it comes to corruption, officials wearing you know, uh, blingy timepieces, Hermes belts uh, that they shouldn't be able to afford on honest official salaries. Those things, when they spread, really get people riled up. And they can endanger, in some cases, end government careers, put people in jail. Obviously, anyone can publish. So big Vs, these opinion leaders, can publish to huge groups of followers. Um, in some cases, who, in aggregate, exceed the membership of the Communist Party. Uh, and web coheres and focuses public opinion and signals to those with minority opinions that they're not alone. So maybe you're only, you know, you're one out of 10 people who believes something. Um, but you go online and you realize, well, that means that there's you know, 100 million people that share my view. Uh, and so I think it, it creates a sense of connection, again, a, among these minority communities of interest. The party does not like that. So then why does the party tolerate the web? You know, uh, I think it was assumed for a while uh, that, that the internet was uncontrollable. But the government uh, in China has, to some extent, brought it under control. And I think they also have seen some of the benefits uh, of a one-party state in having this web. So if we were to try to sort of pitch the internet to the Chinese Communist Party um, you know, in the pre-web days, what arguments might be made for why actually it's a good thing to have? And I think it's interesting. You know, obviously, the internet, I don't need to really say any more, standing where I am in Northern California, is a massive engine for wealth creation. Um, it's also the most influential information distribution mechanism today. 
Uh, for example, there was a very slickly produced ad uh, for the Chinese Communist Party, which is kind of strange if you think about it. You know, it's the only party that runs China. Why do you need an ad to tell people? Like, <laughs> but uh, the CCP, I think a couple months ago, put out this very slick ad, and nobody really noticed because it was just on TV, and young people don't really watch TV. But then it got shared on the internet a few days ago and spread like wildfire. So the internet is now the place where the party also has to go if it wants to change hearts and minds, particularly young uh, hearts and minds. It gives the government transparency into private conversations and overall public sentiment. Uh, as Professor Gold said, China is not a totalitarian state. It doesn't have a microphone in every home listening into every private conversation. But I think it's a fair bet to say that they're able to listen in on every conversation that is held via WeChat, even if it is a conversation among 10 friends. Uh, it allows the Chinese government to monitor public opinion in a way that I think, especially in the absence of other democratic mechanisms, is very helpful to the government in knowing what's going on and spotting where the dangers to its rule might be. Um, obviously, there's a low marginal cost for reproducing and propagating pro-party messaging the marginal cost being essentially zero. Uh, and it's a lot easier to censor using the internet than it might be in some of the old fashioned ways, like going into uh, an issue of The Economist and cutting out the articles that you don't want uh, readers to see. I'm only gonna dwell on this very briefly. Um, there is an evolving body of law, rules, and regulations that the Chinese government has promulgated in order to regulate its internet. And this goes back to the Chinese government's sort of specific vision for its own internet, or what we might call an intranet. Uh, this is a picture of Chinese President and Communist Party General Secretary Xi Jinping, who is also uh, head, of being the chairman of everything, he is the head of the Central Internet Security and Informatization Leading Group, established in 2014. Here he is at the second World Internet Conference held in the Chinese city of Wuzhen. Um, and he said, quote, we should respect internet users' rights to exchange ideas and express their minds, and we should also build good order in cyberspace in accordance with the law, as it will help protect the legitimate rights and interests of all internet users, end quote. So that's, that's, that's the Chinese view, and I think, uh, or the Chinese government view, I should make that distinction. Uh, Xi Jinping and his administration are insisting that they govern the internet according to law. As a pro forma matter, that is in fact true. And it's true because they are moving to codify their control of online speech uh, in written laws. Now, that of course does not make it the right thing to do from a moral perspective or from a policy perspective, um, but it does make it lawful. Uh, switching gears for one second, I just wanted to show you a picture of this gentleman. Does anyone have any idea who he is? Uh, so this is Zhen Zhiqiang. And he is a real estate mogul in China who was one of the last big Vs left who was willing to just say whatever he wanted in Chinese cyberspace, um, partly because he is buddies with uh, anti-corruption and Politburo Standing Committee member, anti-corruption czar and Politburo Standing Committee member Wang Qishan, who is basically probably the second most powerful man in China. Someone can disagree with me on that. Uh, because of his proximity to Wang, he went uncensored for some time, but he had his account shut down a few months ago. Uh, so why have so many big Vs kind of fled, and why has everyone stopped talking? One reason I mentioned before is this crackdown, which has involved uh, inviting big Vs to quote unquote drink tea, which means bringing them in for questioning, um, ranging to much harsher penalties on these folks. But we've also got this evolving body of laws. Um, a few highlights. This is a rule from September 2013. If you write a rumor, defined however the government wants to define it, if you write a rumor online that is read over 5,000 times, you are subject to criminal prosecution. If it is retweeted or shared over 500 times, you are subject to criminal prosecution. Now, if anyone uses Twitter, you know, you can't control how many times someone reads or retweets your comment. So that is kind of a terrifying prospect. Um, there's been a bunch of other laws. Uh, 
I'll probably skip them in the interest of time. Uh, safe to say there's been an expanding toolbox of cudgels for the Chinese government to use. Um, so what is the result of all of this? I've said that Chinese cyberspace has gotten, uh, I guess, less rich from a policy discussion perspective. I'm going to just show this to you to terrify you and then move on. Uh, <laughs> do not show this to your students. Uh, no, um, th this, is, this is something that I put together a couple years back. And it's really, it's called What Gets You Censored on the Chinese Internet. But what it really is, and I'm happy to email this to anyone or share it, uh, it's, a, it's a calculus, it's the calculus that an internet user in China might go through when he or she is writing. And it's really a calculus for how does self-censorship work. And you know, it, it shows you what gets you punished via either censorship or something harsher on the Chinese web. And as you see, there is a path to green. There's a path to OK. And the vast majority of social media posts are not censored. Um, but that's because a lot of stuff doesn't get written. And what it really comes down to is, you know, is your, is your post uh, going to be affecting national conversation? And it's a much more likely that it will if you're famous. But even if you're not famous, are you going to get picked up by someone who is? Is your, is your language going to get picked up by someone who is? Um, and so, of course, this is just a sketch outline of what the effect of this evolving um, set of written and unwritten rules has on internet users. And really, it requires this sort of animal sense of where the red line is. And because the red line between what's allowed and what isn't is fuzzy and constantly shifting, um, it you know, forces internet users to be extremely conservative in some cases um, when, they're, when they're writing, particularly when they're writing for a public platform like Weibo. Um, I'll probably skip this. OK, well, popular demand. Uh, <laughs> suffice to say, I, I said earlier, you know, the Chinese government has been filling the void that it's created with its own, um, with its own party-produced speech. And actually, there's a, there's a studio that's been putting out videos um, that are quite professionally done. It's called Revolutionary Road Studio, Fuxing Lu Studio. Um, nobody really knows anything about them. But it's pretty clear they're linked to the government. And they've been putting out videos uh, intended to affect both domestic and international conversation um, in the, you know, the direction that the party wants. Uh, there was a very uh, catchy video <laughs> call, uh, called Shisan Wu, which means um, uh, 13.5. Uh, it, this is a really long story. It's a, a, a meeting to discuss party policy. Um, and they released this really catchy video. They've also had videos about the South China Sea uh, intended to affect the discourse both at home and abroad. Now, this is not you know, necessarily the kind of thing that we might have in mind when we think about cross-cultural communication. Um, and what about cross-cultural communication? You know, I mentioned the Chinese internet as a window as a, into China, as a community. Um, as a platform for free speech and free debate. But you know, someone asked a question yesterday, well, how do I get my students communicating with students in China? I mean, that should be easy, because we've got this thing called the internet. Um, but in fact, it, it isn't really happening. This, this is a picture of uh, a number of Tea Leaf Nation contributors, because we were really, in our early years, a volunteer-driven, youth-driven organization. Um, and we got a couple hundred people who wanted to help write for us wanted to help be part of this project of translating Chinese discussion for a Western audience. Um, and you know, this is really, I think, where I, I justify the um, slightly catchy title of this talk, Can China Remake the Internet in Its Image? Uh, you know, China's not going to be able to do that, and it doesn't necessarily have the ambition of remaking the entire internet in its image. But the question is whether it's actions which it considers sovereign um, will make the global web a less fruitful place than it could otherwise have been. And what I think we're seeing is that the inherent structure of the internet, which should make it easy to communicate across time zones and cultures and other boundaries, 
um, does not automatically lead to the kind of cross-cultural communication that we would like to see. You know, you need bridge figures. You need people who are actually doing the work, whether it's seeking out, uh, you know, a classroom in Shanghai that's willing to have a dialogue with yours and doing the work of setting up that connection, whether it's someone like Jessica Beinecke, who significantly spent time on the ground in China learning the language and making friends before becoming a social media sensation in China, um, to you know, the folks who've, who've worked for Tea Leaf Nation. Uh, it's not going to happen on its own. It requires folks to kind of be out there trying to do the work. Um, and it's gotten a little bit harder in the last few years. So I think that's really all I've got to say. Uh, feel free to email me if you'd like uh, a copy of that silly looking slide. Um, thanks so much. Thank you, David. Questions for David? Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned about how some individuals in China can get through the different Great Firewall of China through the VPNs. Um, I was in China in June, and I couldn't use my VPNs. They weren't working. So my question to you is, how do the Chinese people themselves actually access the VPNs? And overall, how like, is there a good majority of individuals that are actually using the VPNs to be able to access websites that are otherwise censored by the government? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And I, I can't speak too intelligently about VPNs, partly because I have the luxury of doing my job from DuPont Circle in downtown DC. Um, and I don't really have to wrestle with this stuff very often. Um, it's only, I, I don't think we have statistics on that, although if someone does, I'd love to see them. I think it's a small number of Chinese folks who use VPNs. I do know that some VPNs have stopped working. It's gotten harder to download VPNs when you're within China. Um, and even among those who do use VPNs, many of them are not doing it because they you know, want to share some dissident thought on American Twitter, but because they want to watch some like South Korean drama that isn't, you know, that for IP reasons isn't showing. So I think it's a really small number of people that actually use this. Part of it's actually, I think, for business. You know, the, the great firewall of censorship really is this giant hack that ends up you know, making the internet a less user-friendly experience for everyone. And so businesses within China will frequently have their own VPNs that they use just so that they can actually conduct international commerce. Um, so it's actually a drag on China's economy. Uh, I, I'm in no way an expert on any of that, but uh, a good majority of my class are teenagers from China who routinely go back to China. And so when I have this discussion in my class, I'm always like, how do you guys deal with the Great Firewall? And they're just kind of, they're just like, oh, you just put up a VPN, like it's nothing. So I, I, I kind of got the impression that perhaps among the younger group, mm. it's very easy. Uh, and, and like you said, if there's no dissidents, um, they're just trying to get to Steam to play their video games. But uh, it, it's, it, it, at, at least in the opinion of my students, it was so commonplace and so, like, it, 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 there was no thought. It was just, oh yeah, just toss that up. And I'm like, doesn't the Chinese government have a problem with that? And they're like, probably, but. There's a billion of us, <laughs> so. That's a really interesting, that's a really interesting comment. Um, and thanks for that. I mean, what's interesting, what I found is that, you know, when you talk to young folks about how they use the web in China, they do, they kind of accept, I think they accept the status quo to some extent because they know they're not gonna change it. So, they, right. I mean, it's like the weather. You know, complaining about it doesn't do, doesn't do you any good. Um, and I think also to some extent that, and that's why I shared that self-censorship chart, I think the, 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 the government's concept about what is acceptable and what isn't has, uh, has been internalized by a lot of Chinese internet users. And there's the sense that like, well, you don't wanna be, you don't wanna be irresponsible. I mean, you don't wanna say something irresponsible, but you know, that might actually be the height of responsibility. It might involve going on a Weibo and saying, you know, I've got a problem with something that the government considers political. But I, a lot of people really aren't interested in that because they've got lives to lead. And go, ahead. go ahead, Jessica. Uh, I think it would be really cool if you could talk about all the things that WeChat can do other than just messaging, because it's pretty in incredible. 
uh, all the things that people use WeChat for in addition to talking to their friends privately? Um, well, sure. I, I, I flicked at a couple of the you know, functionalities that WeChat has, like paying bills, um, booking doctor's appointments, hailing cabs. Uh, I, I, I don't know the full suite of possibilities that WeChat presents. But uh, Jessica, feel free to. Also, Victoria Wu from Tencent is going to give a talk in a couple hours. So she will probably tell you much more um, than I know about that. But one thing that's interesting is you know, the way in which these platforms do end up, I guess, you know, not just creating connections, but also reinforcing old connections. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in China in this really, really remote place. And when I left, actually, because SARS broke out and they pulled us all out with 24 hours notice, I thought I'd never see a lot of these folks again. And now, because of Facebook, which some of them access anyway, um, and WeChat, I'm hearing from these old students and these old friends and having conversations with them right now. So um, it's incredible. Last question here. Sure. Thanks for your talk. Um, I, <clears throat> I had a question about Ai Weiwei um, and his uh, house arrest, and, and I, asked, uh, I might be incorrect in stating that China still has the most journalists in jail today, um, bloggers, um, journalists, writers, and um, I'm, con I'm kind of confused as to what are the red flags for the government still, you know, Tiananmen Square, mm. um, cer certain things that kind of the government censors pick up, um, and, uh, you know, you said that you stated it's kind of this animal sense of what not to to post. Um, what are the red flags? What what are the things that you see instantly? The um, journalist or bloggers or whomever is posting um, beyond Tiananmen Square and the government. What what are the things that they don't want out there? Gosh, uh, it's a great question. It's it's a pretty long list, particularly in the last few years. Um, constitutionalism, um, you know, anything that infuses Western values in, uh, or so-called universal values in Chinese education. Um, reporting on the Chinese stock market, um, you know, problems with the stock market. Um, I mean, it's a pretty, it, it's honestly a pretty long list. You know, the, the, the way the equation used to be was that as long as you complained sort of abstractly about the government, you were okay. And if you complained about local government, it was all right, even if it might get that official in trouble, um, because the central government saw that as a nice way to uncover localized corruption. Um, you know, Xi Jinping has a um, very broad sense of like what constitutes an attack on the party's dignity and distinctive Chineseness. Um, so journalists have gotten punished for all sorts of things, even, even just writing about the stock market. Um, it's a long list. And there's a, a document, uh, document number nine, which lists like a bunch of um, topics that are forbidden. And things like universal values are actually on that list.